Hey, hey, hey! <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Mass and Drum on this Whiskey Wednesday night. I'm Jason C., your host, your uh, your fellow whiskey enthusiast, just here having some good pours, giving you guys all the info you can handle. We have a huge show tonight. Um, coming a week off while I was traveling last week, completely forgot I was traveling last week, so sorry about missing the stream last week. Uh, shouldn't be missing any others for quite a while, but um, but man. I am uh, I am really pumped for tonight. Uh, tonight we have a huge show, guys. We have so much whiskey news to talk about. So many things happened in the last couple weeks, just blowing my mind. Um, we have a few new bottles to taste, including the uh, anticipated uh, Blood Oath Pack 9 from Lux Row. So we're going to dive into that one. Uh, we have, you know, Elijah Craig dropping age statements off of Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, Penelope getting bought up. Uh, Sazerac, CEO, stepping down. There's so much stuff happening in whiskey right now. It is crazy. Um, and then later on in the show, we are going to welcome on Jonathan Mezzano, founder of the K. Luke uh, brand of bourbons, of, uh, of bourbon blends, I should say. You know, I'm really anxious to talk to him to see how he turned one of the most, probably one of the most successful single barrel programs in the country into... into that um, and see what happens with that. Let's see here. Just our Lux Row picked up Penelope. <laughs> oh, man. So much stuff going on here. Let's see here. Um, MGP did. Sure, we'll find out soon. Yeah, a lot of people saying a lot of fun stuff about this. Um, all right. So, what we what we've got, guys, is like I said, a, a crazy pack show. What is happening? Now I'm having internet issues again. I thought I fixed this. Hold on, guys. I'll be right back. All right, and we're back. Hopefully, oh, what is happening right now? Oh. All right. I don't know if this is a StreamYard issue or my internet it seems to be happening with StreamYard very often lately. Sorry, guys. Hopefully it figures it out. All right. Stay off the screen. It works. Then. <laughs> uh, okay. Hey, if anyone from StreamYard is watching, fix that shit. All right. Stupid internet. Yeah, exactly. All right. So first and foremost, I am enjoying... So everybody in the uh, Mass and Journey uh, Whiskey Club, m &J Army, hope you guys are doing well. Uh, man, tomorrow we have a huge release, huge single barrel release. We are releasing three Wild Turkey barrels, including uh, one Russell's Reserve and two Kentucky Spirits. On top of that, we are releasing a Westland single barrel pick from, um, uh, <laughs> from Westland, which is a... Toasted port finish, American single malt, cast strength, seven years old, amazing stuff. It tastes like chocolate covered raspberries. So I am drinking right now the uh, the Where's Jimmy pick, uh, which is just pure. Oh my god, this is as sweet as it gets when it comes to wild turkey. This is like drinking a slice of cake. So let me guys let me let me know in the chat what you guys are sipping on right now as we get this show rolling. Got to be back. Cheers, guys. Uh, let's see here. What's up with the lid on the head? Yeah, it's a goat. And up here, it says goat. I'm not saying I'm the goat, but it's nice to wear a hat that says the goat. You know what I'm saying? 
Uh, let's see here. Jason, what were the specs in our Jack Daniels single bar bottle proof rye, bottle date, and proof? Uh, on our on our Jack Daniels single barrel proof rye, the one that I tried two weeks ago, that one you're talking about, I will have to look at that one. Uh, that one's sitting over there. I could I can remind me later. I could I could uh, try to get into that one. Um, you can't put that stuff down. Surprise, there's any left. I'm sipping a pick source from from distill. Uh, working on that. Robert Shea is working at the firehouse tonight. No drinks for me, unfortunately. All right, man. Well, if you get called in, please stay safe. Cheers to all the firefighters, police, um, everybody that's serving our country out there. Haven't said that in a while. I feel like we have to do that every now and again because, you know, you guys are the ones out there putting your life on the line. So thank you, everybody. Um, we'll be sipping K. Luke Batch 3 Barrel Strength tonight, says Jonathan Pecoraro. Pecor Pecoraro. I almost said Pecorano, and I, like, switched it mid-sentence. <laughs> Um, cracked open Russell's private select to celebrate tomorrow's drop. Yeah. I mean, three, three different barrel picks. Uh, and then that, that Westland, which is just ridiculous. So cheers to you guys. Which was the Turkey pick one that was supposed to be the Russell's pick. This is the one right here. Get strunk. The where's Jimmy. We thought this was going to be a Russell's pick and end up being, uh, the proof was too low in the barrel. So it ended up being a, uh, Kentucky spirit pick. So, yep. Um, actually, sipping on the Blood Oath Pack 9 right now. Just found one. Decided to try and find some YouTube reviews and saw the stream was happening. Says BF. Um, yeah, we. I have not even touched that yet. So, I'm interested to see how that goes. But, man, I mean, I got to get started here because we need to uh, we need to get into a lot of the news here. So, we're going to we're going to kick it off real early. Uh, Boomer says buying three tomorrow. Sipping on a Rare Bird 101 Wild Turkey Kentucky Spirit. Yeah, the other Kentucky Spirit bottle that we have tomorrow uh, was actually selected by Rare Bird 101, but it was turned down by the group, the Philadelphia Phillies, apparently. I don't know the story behind that. I have to find out what the story is. It was a Philadelphia Phillies Kentucky Spirit pick. They turned it down, and it's now ours. So, But Rare Bird 101 selected it, so you know it's really good, and it actually is really good. So, um, all right. Boomer, thank you so much for the first Super Chat of the night. Um, let's get into a couple of the news stories that hit. First and foremost, we got to talk about it, guys. Did everybody see this label right here? Hit the whiskey sphere. Daniel Weller and the Emmer Wheat Recipe 1794, 94 proof. That's right. We're going to get a new Weller. And there's a story behind it, guys. Uh, in 1794, Daniel Weller, who is the grandfather of William LaRue Weller, left Maryland and made the long voyage down the Ohio River Daniel traveled with his wife and children, ultimately setting in Kentucky, where he would continue the family tradition of distilling. Our Emmer wheat recipe is inspired by Daniel and his pioneering spirit, rarely seen in modern day stills. Emmer wheat is an ancient Egyptian grain that was used in bread and beer. This is a tribute to Daniel, the trailblazer of the Weller family. So um, I think this is, again, another pattern we're seeing with uh, distillers using ancient grains, using hard to find grains, different grains, drawing something unique out of a out of a still and a cask to bring something new to the whiskey verse. And and I mean, I can't blame him for doing that. That's what everybody wants. I think I think if like we saw another Weller, you know, bottled and bond or a Weller, another finished Weller, um, you know, I, I'm not really sure how that would have went down. Uh, like if Weller had like a toasted barrel that came out. I feel like people would be like, eh, there's toasted stuff everywhere. I'm not going to chase that. But you add an ancient grain to the mix, and all of a sudden, everyone's curiosity perks up. But, I mean, every time I hear new Weller is coming out, this is what I think about. Never going to get it, never going to get it, never going to get it, never going to get it. <laughs> never going to get it. <laughs> never. Nobody's getting that bottle. <laughs> Nobody is getting that bottle. It'll end up on secondary markets from liquor stores charging at least $1,500, at least off the bat, before it comes down back to reality a little bit. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, 700 secondary already. I think it's going to be higher than that. I mean, yeah, it's going to, yeah, outside. <laughs> I'm dead. Yeah, no, we're never going to get it. We're never going to get it. What's the secondary price going to be? I believe it's going to be over $1,000 in the beginning, and then it'll start coming back to earth a little bit. Um, 
yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy. It'll be another forgettable Weller. I mean, I think the grain thing does add a a little bit of mystery to it, which I think is kind of cool. But at the same time, you know, just we're, we're just never going to see it. Uh, Tony Bag of Donuts, what's up, you stunad? <laughs> Love you, man. Thank you so much for the uh, super chat. Cheers. Um, by the way, if anybody if anybody watched Matt Madness this past Friday, I, uh, I I won my round again. I've made it to the semifinals, the final four. So it's um, it's myself, David from Shelf Turds, Daniel Shook from Bourbon Junkies, and Chad Perkins from uh, It's Bourbon Night. So it's going to be a hell of a final four. So we'll see what happens. We'll see if I could uh, try to win it this year. But it was uh, it was a fun blind. We did all. It was ended up being all Heaven Hill. We had three Larceny Barrel Proofs and Elijah Craig Barrel Proof in there. So cheers to not embarrassing myself this year and actually getting to the semifinals. I'm good with that. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, let's see here. You got to take it, says David Burns. <laughs> Man, I'm going to try. I'm, I'm riding a hot streak. I just hope it doesn't end anytime soon. I'm trying to trying to keep it going here. Um, uh, stoked to see you come through, says Brandon Lincoln. Appreciate that, man. Uh, also, a real quick cheers to the Central Ohio Whiskey Society. If you guys, if any of you guys members are watching, we were just at an event tonight um, at the Ohio Brewing Company. Um, and we got to talk with um, uh, Buzzard Roost was was presenting. So uh, so Judy from Buzzard Roost, who's part owner with Jason, she is incredible. She is a huge ambassador of whiskey and everything that goes into making it. I'm a huge fan of Buzzard Roost and what they do. They are taking what they have, even though it's like four, five, six. I think they have a couple seven-year-old barrels as well. And they are doing you know, what they can with it to make it the best whiskey. They're utilizing uh, independent stave to bring the most flavor they can out of those barrels as well. Doing different finishing, different char levels, mainly char ones, which really you know, will bring out sweetness into a whiskey. Uh, doing some double barreling. I, I mean, I love what Buzz of the Rooster is doing. So if any of you guys are watching, cheers. Really fun event tonight. Um, Kenneth, I have not had the BEP yet. Um, I, I did find one online, uh, at a store that ships to Ohio. So I'm hoping to get it soon. So you'll see, you'll see a video of that soon drop. Then eventually I'm going to put every, every single one in a blind and see how we do on one of these lives. So we'll see how it goes. Um, all right, let's go to the next, um, quick news story. Uh, Blue Run, did anybody get a bunch of the Mother's Day releases? I'm just curious. Um, there was, I felt like it was like 75 of them that were released at the same time. They were all like $200, $250. I know Sealbox released a bunch. Um, you could buy the whole set, I think, for like $2,500. Um, I'm just curious if anybody got them. You know, again, you know, what they do with marketing, I think, is is extremely clever. You know, doing a Mother's Day release with the kind of the pink butterflies. I mean, very cool. But you're still looking at, you know, Low age whiskey for a high price. I'm just, you know, it is what it is. But that did, um, Shook did, I think, bought them all. Well, you know, Dan's going to buy all of them. You know, he is. That's not a surprise to me. <laughs> uh, speaking of Blue Run, it looks like they're going to be coming out with an eight year Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. Now, this is going to be 100 proof. It looks like, um, I'm not sure if that's a placeholder or it's going to be higher than that. But eight years old, I'm I'm guessing that's sourced. I'm guessing that's a sourced whiskey. The only thing that makes me nervous if if uh, if their regular stuff, four years old, five years old, is like that hundred hundred twenty dollar mark. You know what's an eight year going to be? Is an eight year going to be one hundred fifty to two hundred? That'll be interesting to see what the pricing is that you know of that when that thing comes out and hits the market. Um, all right, let's talk about it. Let's talk about this right here. Elijah Craig Barrel Proof recently announced that they are going to be revamping their age statements on uh, on Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. And um, I mean, it, it, it's one of those things where I don't know if we should be worried about it. Um, if you look in the history of Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, honestly, guys, if you look through the history of Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, they have changed. They have been changing the, just the Elijah Craig expressions over the past what, like ten to twelve years. 
I mean, you can go all the way back to, you know, back to 2012, 2010. I, I forgot the exact dates. You know, when they changed the Logic Craig 18 to a Logic Craig 20. Um, then they then they took the 12 year on the front of the small batch Elijah Craig when it was the old school pirate bottle, and then they put it on the back of the bottle. There was a huge hubbub about that. People thinking that they're gonna like get tricked, you know, as far as you know, it's not the real age of the whiskey. Um, then they just dropped the 12 year altogether. Um, you know, then you know, as as we kind of went on, Elijah Craig barrel picks became available. Um, then, you know, we saw 2021 where Elijah Craig barrel proof went down to like 118 proof and people were like, what the hell's going on? You know, why is it, why is it so low in the barrel proof now? Um, and then if you go to just this year in January, uh, Heaven Hill kind of stated that everything was okay. We're just going to start putting flexible age statements on the labels of Elijah Craig barrel proof. And you never know, there could be a 13 year old release or something like that. Um, you know, I, I think they really want us to trust them and what they're doing. Um, and then just, you know, just this past week, this image that you're seeing kind of got leaked on the internet. And um, this B523 says 11 years, five months. Um, and I think everybody lost their mind. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, I think the 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 knee jerk reaction is is that everybody thinks okay, we're running out of age stock, um, but you know, I don't think that's going to be the case, guys. Honestly, let me let me get rid of this. I think basically what they're doing is I don't I don't see it as much as age stock. I mean, that could be an issue. It could be a thing, um, but I'll say this. Remember that. Elijah Craig Barrel Proof is a small batch product. So a lot of people forget that. They think that they see 12 years on the label and everything is 12 years old. There could be older whiskey in it. Remember, by law, the youngest whiskey on the bottle, you know, that age statement on the bottle is what has to be what has to be shown, essentially. So this picture here, 11 years, five months, that's the that's the youngest whiskey that's in that bottle. So, and being a small batch product, there could be 13 year, 14 year. I mean, you don't know what age whiskey is in, is, is in that bottle. Now I get it. You're saying, okay, so now what if we see 10 year, nine year? I wouldn't start freaking out until we start seeing like nine year, eight year, you know, type of, uh, of age statements being put on those bottles. Um, I think what's really going to freak people out is the pricing. Generally, and I still think it'll stay the same, a logic cake brow proof is going to remain one of the top values in bourbon today. Um, now, if we start seeing eight year, nine years, you know, age statements regularly, because I mean, we don't know the proportions of those small batch bourbons. We don't, we don't know how much, if there is older whiskey in it, we don't know. It could be, you know, 85% eight year, and then like a smidgen, you know, then, then the, the other 15% is maybe 12, 13, 14 year old stuff. We don't, we don't have the insight to those proportions and when they're, you know, when they're doing small batch. And remember, there's no sort of uh, legal definition for small batch. It could be two barrels, three barrels. It could be a thousand barrels. There's no distinction for that. So uh, I think what's really going to get crazy is if the price increases as the age statements get lower. Now, if the price stays the same, if we're still about $70 SRP, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I think the issue is going to come in when we start seeing very low age statements. Because look at the barrel picks. You have barrel picks that are out there. Our first ever, you know, my first ever Elijah Craig barrel proof pick was an eight-year-old barrel. So I, and it was really good, but it did, you know, it, it, it did miss some of that older whiskey depth to it, but it was the best tasting one we got out of the three. The other two were terrible. So if you see the, if you start seeing that, that younger age statement start hitting the market and the price increases, then I think that's when real, a frenzy is going to completely start. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it too much yet. Um, yeah, seven, eight year and up the price to 90 plus it's bad. Yeah. That's when it's gonna, that's when it's going to start getting crazy. Um, yeah, the change isn't bad right now. I'm not going to see me make excuses for a gigantic, for a gigantic company though. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not, I don't know. 
Does it suck in a, in a little bit of a way? Yeah, it does. You never want to see H statements go down. But anybody who acts like Elijah Craig hasn't done this before or Heaven Hill hasn't done this before doesn't know bourbon history. I think Elijah Craig might be the most toyed with label, one of, one of the most, besides maybe Knob Creek, even Wild Turkey. These guys change labels and age statements. If you look at the in, in the history of bourbon, these labels change constantly. And Elijah Craig is no exception. Will it go back to 12 years at one time soon? Maybe. I mean, Heaven Hill has not stopped building Rick houses, so you never know as time goes on what's going to happen. My only thing is, does it suck to see it go? Absolutely. Does it piss me off a little bit? Yeah, a little bit, but I won't really be that upset unless we see an eight to nine year consistent, uh, you know, consistently on those labels and a price increase. So that's my, that's my, that's my rant on that for a little bit. I don't know. Let, let's see what you guys are saying here. People have been paying five to ten dollars more for the eight year single barrels and the ABC batches, and the batches are arguably better. I admire the transparency as long as the juice in the bottle is good. Yeah, Ron, that's a really good point. Transparency. I mean. They could have told us nothing, <laughs> you know, honestly, just through a random age statement on it. I'm, I'm, I think they, I think Heaven Hill understands the popularity of that, of that whiskey, of that bourbon and how much people love it. So I think they owed it to us to kind of tell us what's going on. You know, I, I definitely applaud them for it for sure. Um, I'm as long, I'm okay. As long as they keep the age on the bottles, that's fine. But what if the ages start consistently being like eight, nine years old? Um, even though they can be really good, I think that's when people will really start to lose their minds, um, for sure. Let's see here. Um, private barrel ECB is only eight year ranges already, right? Yeah, Rusty B, you could see eight, nine, ten. It's a big range. Usually, it's anywhere from eight to, you know, maybe eleven to twelve. You're you're lucky if you get a twelve year and a single barrel pick from live from uh, from Heaven Hill. Usually, it's like that eight to ten or eleven range generally. Um, Let's see here. We got a lot of cool people here in the chat. Uh, Beyond the Rose in the house. What a great channel. Guys, thank you so much for uh, for chiming in. Cheers to me and you in person in Kentucky. Bucket list check. You are awesome. <laughs> nice to see you guys as well. That was like running into you. I was like, oh, my God, it's Beyond the Row. You guys definitely got to check out their channel. Uh, they do amazing content. Um, let's see here. Yeah, Heaven Hill is doing better than ever. Seven months younger, BS, drain poor. Um, Let's see. I don't like it going to major markups now. I mean, I don't think that's just going to, I don't think that's going to stop either way. I think people are going to mark it up no matter what it is because it's a logic Craig barrel proof. Um, I mean, you never know. They could get better. If, if some folks don't like an oakier profile of logic Craig barrel proof, the younger ones might inherently have some sweeter flavors to it. So, yep. So we'll see. Uh, as long as it tastes good, guys. I mean, people get hung up on this stuff. As long as the whiskey is good. The whiskey comes out and it's crap, then complain. But until until they could put out, until they could unimpress me, you know, three or four, uh, three or three or four releases in a row, I'm still on the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof train for, for sure. All right. So we nailed that one. Next up, uh, Penelope. I mean, holy hell, Penelope getting bought out this it it, it was i'm not going to say it was a surprise but i do think the amount that they bought it for was a surprise this acquisition uh from mgp was announced monday um that its subsidiary luxco acquired 100 percent of penelope bourbon for a like i said a, a surprisingly high price they sold it for $105 million up front with a max potential buyout of $110.8 million by the end of 2025 if certain performance conditions are met. Um, this is certainly not the biggest, you know, the, certainly not the biggest one that we've seen. Uh, Campari just bought Wilderness Trail for $600 million, but, you know, that was, a whole, that was an entire distillery with huge amount of stocks. Um, Basically, by buying Penelope, MGP now owns all the brand's intellectual property and inventory of bottled products and aging whiskey, which is hilarious because most of Penelope's stuff is MGP's <laughs> anyway. Um, so since Penelope purchases all of its aging whiskey from MGP, MGP is essentially buying back the barrels from Penelope as, you know, as well as bringing a flourishing brand in-house. So what does this mean? It, it basically means that MGP 
is trying to um, – what's the weakest part of MGP? Everybody say it together. Marketing. They're terrible at marketing. They're, they're, and, and I don't know if it's completely their fault, but they have allowed so many brands to source from them that they have stuff scattered all over the place. So there are a million different brands using MGP, but when it comes to their own whiskey, it gets overshadowed by all the other whiskeys that are out there on the market. So buying Luxro, buying, um, buying Luxro, who now bought Penelope, MGP is buying these, these brands to serve as in-house brands now. So that is just bumping up their portfolio and bumping up the spotlight on who MGP slash Ross and Squibb is. Um, so now they have marketing power. Um, they have a, um, an umbrella of brands that's only going to make them stronger. Um, so Penelope, Luxro, by association, maybe people will get to know MGP a little bit more and what exactly that brand is, what that story is. They'll get to know the Remus brand a little bit more. Um, they'll get to know Rossville Union maybe a little bit more, uh, but nobody really talks about those. They they have, um, you know, they, they have decent brands, but um, yeah, their house brands usually suck. I mean, that's the thing. Crazy to imagine that conversation with the daughter. We we sold your name for a hundred million dollars. Yeah, and this is not to be lost on because I think people miss one really brilliant detail about what Penelope does and what they did. Penelope chose, even though, you know, Mike Palladini and, and Danny over there, they, they named the brand after uh, Mike's daughter, Penelope. And think about the whiskey shelves today. How many brands on the shelf are named after a female? I mean, maybe Widow Jane. Um, I'm struggling to think of another one. You know, usually it's something real trendy. Usually it's, it's an old dude's name. I think that's what makes Penelope stand out. I think that's what MGP recognized. And I think that's why it was purchased. So um, uh, huge congratulations to Mike and Danny. Uh, you, know, you know, maybe at this point they'll have even more barrels to play with now that MGP owns them. It's not just about, you know, since MGP kind of bought those barrels back, you know, they may have access to some of the higher age MGP uh, barrels that, you know, Old Carter gets to play with and, uh, you know, Barrel King and some of the other higher end brands that get access to some of these higher age barrels that Penelope hasn't had access to. So you never know what could happen down the line. <coughs> Excuse me. I think it's a brilliant move for, for MGP. It's just going to build up their equity, build up their brand. Huge congrats to the guys at Penelope. It couldn't have happened to two better guys. If anyone has ever met Mike and Danny, they are some of the best people in whiskey that you're ever going to meet. So cheers to them. Uh, Bella Bedford. Yeah, but really nobody knows who that is. Maddie Gladden. That's a that's a good brand. But again, smaller brand, a little bit more regional. There's some stuff out there. Jim, <laughs> Jim Beam is kind of a sissy name. <laughs> uh, that one got me. I like that one. <laughs> Booker's is a cute name. Oh, Rebecca Creek. Rebecca Creek is out there. Not too, not too bad. Uh, so does that mean since they don't need to source MGP anymore because they are MGP, does that mean prices are coming down? Um, I would guess not, especially if – now, I don't know what those contingencies are. Like, not contingencies, but I don't know what those requirements are uh, for them to, um, you know, hit that mark in order to make that full amount. And I would imagine there's a number of sales involved in that, as there usually is. So if they have to hit a specific number to make all the rest of that money, then I would imagine prices aren't going to come down. I mean, do prices ever really come down anymore in bourbon? Think about it. Come on, Wade. It ain't happening. Yeah, apparently the, the, the blenders are staying. Everyone's staying on board. It's just a, it's just kind of a shift in ownership. Um, so yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Fortuna. I'll st I'm still staying Pinhook could be on the list. It makes sense. Oh, as far as like the next brand to be bought. Yep. Pinhook could be there. Um, Booker's Pinkies batch makes me feel like a man. <laughs> yeah, they're definitely going to retain the profits uh, for sure, Tim. You know, and you know, we don't know the ins and outs of exactly, you know, who's getting what. I mean, we do know that MGP is getting, you know, all the barrels they have aging, which is their barrels anyway. 
But I would be very curious to see if we start seeing maybe some more limited release blends or limited release options from Penelope coming down the line because now they'll have more access to some of these barrels. So I think that's the interesting thing to watch out for. Um, all right. Uh, real quick, the, this guy, you, you may not know who he is, but this is the uh, CEO of, or the, I should say the former CEO of Buffalo Trace, um, CEO and president of Buffalo Trace owners Sazerac to step down. Mark Brown will step down as CEO and president of Sazerac and will be replaced by Sazerac's chief commercial officer, Jake Wentz. Um, his resignation will go into effect July 1st. The transition was part of a long signaled and eight year succession plan. So this has been in the works. Uh, Brown's full employment timeline started in 1971, went all the way up until 1997 when he became the president and CEO of Sazerac uh, Company Inc. Um, in April, Buffalo Trace announced two new whiskeys, the Old Charter Oak and the Buffalo Trace Experimental Peated Bourbon. Um, so that's kind of like the newest stuff coming out of Buffalo Trace. But he's stepping down. He's going to be replaced here um, by Jake Wentz. So, I mean, not like, you know, it's not like we all know the guy. But anytime Sazerac or Buffalo Trace makes a move, it's news. So there you go. Um, and man, that was a lot. That was a lot of stuff to go through. All right. What are you guys saying? All right. I got to I need a drink here. That was a lot of shit to go through. Uh, only way I see prices going down is if craft keeps getting better. Probably doesn't apply to normal drinkers though. Um, let's see. Um, pop them to watch them here. They slowly phasing out the older ones, not new stuff. Uh, just because it says Tennessee doesn't necessarily mean it's Dickel. Yeah, that's true. That's true. There is Tennessee Distilling Company, which is not Dickel. It's actually the stuff that uh, Bourbon Pursuit uses in their Pursuit United. It's not Telahoma Tennessee whiskey. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do here, because I'm enjoying the hell out of this, I'm going to get this Blood Oath poured because I it is a finished whiskey, so I do want it to get a little air time. So Blood Oath, pack number nine, Kentucky Straight Bourbon. Finish in Oloroso sherry casks, and we're gonna we're gonna go through the the stats here of this one. Um, yeah, I told you there was a lot of news tonight, guys. There's just a lot of stuff happening in whiskey right now. Um, uh, let's see here. Whiskey juice, yeah, Verkla. Let's see here. Best thing ever from Tullahoma. Worth <laughs> worth that. Uh, Richie Z in the house. What is going on? Nice to see you. Hank Williams here. Did I miss any other super chats? I'm sorry if I did. No, last one is beyond the row. Okay. We have over 400 people in the chat. Thank you guys so much for uh, for hopping on. Um, Cecil allows non-Kentucky in his juice. <laughs> yes, Wade. He has New York and he has uh, Tennessee non-Telahoma. That's what the P Pursuit United is. Uh, have not tried Penelope Rio yet. I'm hearing good things, Nick. Um, should have a, a sample bottle uh, soon. Luck sent you a whole ass bottle. I just got a baby sampler. Sons of bees. No, uh, Matt, I, I found this one on my own, buddy. This was not sent to me. I bought this with my own hard-earned money. <laughs> uh, Liam Stone says he enjoyed uh, the pack nine. How much was the blood oath? So retail, I believe it's what, $130, I believe. It's 98.6 proof. Uh, yeah, we'll get into that in a little bit. But before we do that, let's uh, let's let's kind of run through some of these new labels because there's a lot of them here. Uh, we already talked about Weller, um, and I just want to get it in your head because every time you think uh, Weller, you're gonna think this. Never gonna get it. Never gonna get it. Never gonna get it. Never gonna get it. <laughs> uh, I love that. Uh, okay, so first and foremost, still Austin out of Texas releasing a bunch of crazy stuff coming out soon. First and foremost, looks like they're going to have a bottled and bond straight rye whiskey. Um, looks like they're going to have a blue corn whiskey uh, in winter 2023. Blue corn is actually something you see a good amount of out of Texas, which is interesting. Good to see uh, blue corn coming back. We'll see how well still Austin uh, distills it. 
Um, we have the High Riot Bourbon Whiskey, bottled in bond, coming from Still Austin. We also have a Red Corn Bourbon Whiskey coming from Still Austin, also bottled in bond, 100 proof. So all these different 100 proof varietals coming out of Still Austin with a little bit of a different 100 proof spin on it. Um, I do like the fact that they're using some of those varietals, but blue corn and red corn can be very tricky. Uh, you know, blue corn is usually inherently a little bit sweeter. Uh, red corn, however, is a little bit starchier, a little bit nuttier. Um, there's less sugar in red corn. It's more starch. So as it ages, um, usually what you get is a little bit of a nuttier profile. There's some sweet there too, but you have a little bit of a nuttiness to it with, uh, with red corn. Blue corn tends to be really sweet as well. So I guess we'll see what happens. If you're a fan of Still Austin, keep an eye out for those because, you know, you never know. They could be good. Nancy Fraley kind of, you know, behind them, maybe helping them do some of that distilling. Um, it's, you know, I, I have faith. You know, I've, I've had some weird blue corn. I've had some weird weird red corn stuff. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Uh, Frey Ranch coming in with a smoked grain series. Looks like they're going to have a rye and smoked oat whiskey aged for six years. These are going to be 375 milliliter bottles. Uh, I am guessing these will be distillery only releases, I'm thinking. So if you look on the right side of the screen there, it tells you the uh, the mash bill. 60% 60, 60 winter rye, 40% oat grown and harvested on Frey Ranch, and it's smoked oat whiskey. They're also releasing an American single malt that's smoked. So... Think of it as like the American, their version of a peated whiskey almost um, from Isla in Scotland. Um, now, there's a difference between, you know, obviously peat smoke can be different from the way they smoked it, whether it's, you know, wood smoke, cherry wood smoke. It could have more of a barbecue note to it rather than a medicinal one that you get to peat. So, you know, if you guys like smoked uh, whiskeys, that might be something to keep an eye on if you're a fan of Frey Ranch. Kentucky Owl announced the Meister edition. Um, that's that's how I'm choosing to pronounce it. I think it's pronounced Meister. This is basically John Rea, who's the uh, master blender at Kentucky Owl, teaming up with Maureen Robinson, who is a Scotch whiskey master blender. Uh, they have come together to blend this next version of Kentucky Owl together. Um, have absolutely no idea what the ages in this whiskey will be. But it's a Kentucky Owl, so you could probably expect a $500 to $600 price tag, which is probably pretty insane. But that's what we're looking at these days with this stuff. Um, Forgate coming out with a couple new labels too. Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey finished in Spanish. Oloroso Cherry Dark Rum Casks, aged seven years. Um, that sounds delicious as usual. And it looks like they're going to be coming out with another foundation. This is a Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey barrel proof. 10 years old. Now, the last foundation we saw was Indiana. That was the NGP 10-year. They also brought out that Hazmat Indiana 14-year. Um, this is a Kentucky straight bourbon, so I'm not sure where this one's coming from, but it is a 10-year foundation Kentucky straight bourbon, um, barrel-proof. Usually, those run about 250 bucks. usually. So if you're a four-gate fan and you don't worry about, you know, don't mind spending the money on that, you know, you could look out for that label coming down the line. Lastly, OKI has released the details of their next blended whiskey. The OKI Reserve number two uh, looks like it's going to be a 95% dark rye, 5% malted rye uh, from Middle West Spirits right here in good old Columbus, Ohio. One of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite local whiskeys that's being made right now is that, that dark pumpernickel rye out of uh, Middle West. Um, it looks like they're going to be using a Bardstown Bourbon Company, 68 corn, 20% rye, 12% malted barley. That is the K. And then you have the I, which is from MGP, obviously from Indiana, 95% rye, 95.5 uh, rye from Indiana. Um, let's see the back of the label here. Let's see. Batch two is an exceptional and first of its kind blend of bourbon and rye whiskey from three iconic distilleries in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. Um, no ages given in this. We'll see what happens. I was not a big fan of the first batch release. They had so much stuff going on in that, in that blend. I know some people liked it. I was not a fan. I thought it felt disjointed. It was kind of all over the place for my palate. Was not a big fan of it. I know some people liked it. Um, the fact that it's got some of the Middle West dark pumpernickel rye in it, I'm kind of excited about that. So we'll see, uh, we'll see how that one goes. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't buy you one. <laughs> so I didn't buy you one, buddy. Um, let's see. Passed on the uh, last weekend, just not in the budget. Looking for the Middle West ported pumpernickel cast strength rye. Nice. Um, what's up, Emily? Nice to see you. Can't wait for that 21090 barrel from still Austin. Jason, did you try the Bart Bartstown Origin White Label? It's my new favorite. Yeah, Beyond the Road. Yeah, I mean, I I love that entire Origin series. I think it's I think that White Label, the the weeded the weeded 100 proofer. I think that has the ability to be one of the best values out there. Uh, when you when you're looking at you know whiskeys, you know on the shelf, especially being a weeder, going right up against Makers, going right up against Weller. Giving the big middle finger to Weller, I think, in a little bit of a way, you know, it, it, it's cool. I'm definitely, I definitely dig it. Um, F yo owl. <laughs> um, let's see here. Um, have all three excellent of the OKI Reserve One. Um, are there any good places to hit up in the brewery district? I'm renting a house for 11 days, and it's June through the first week of July. Krista Nolan, um, as far as like whiskey goes, or you talk about like food, you should you definitely have to go to Arapazo and have yourself an arepa over there in the brewery district. It's my favorite place to eat. Um, yeah, if if any of you guys ever want to, you know, meet up or something, chances are you could run into me at Arapazo. <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> I love it. Um, all right. Let's get into this. Uh, let's get into this blood oath pack nine. So here are the stats here. So we have a 16-year-old bourbon, a 12-year-old bourbon, and a seven-year-old bourbon finished in Spanish Oloroso sherry casks, which carries. Uh, and I don't want to read the. I do not want to read the tasting notes. You know what? We'll go back and taste and check the tasting notes and see what it says. Um, and, it, and if I pick up any of the stuff that they're saying, bottled at 98.6 proof. So let's dive in, see what we get, guys. I also have another little surprise bottle here we're going to try soon. It's uh, kind of peeking behind there. You see that one? Three chord. We're going to try that one too. Then uh, uh, again, guys, a little bit later on, uh, Jonathan Mezano from K Luke Whiskey is going to join the show live. And we're going to taste through his new uh, batch four of his small batch and his uh, barrel strength uh, uh, whiskeys. So let's go for it. Here we go. Uh, now, this is what usually happens. Uh, you know, if you guys are familiar with Blood Oath, basically what they do is they'll take two high-aged bourbons, and then basically what they do is they'll take the youngest of all of them and then finish it. That's what happened. That's Basically, what's been happening with all the, the finished um, variants in the last several years. So, first thing with the sherry cask, I love how fruit forward this is. And, you know, this could inherently just be from the, from the older bourbon in it. Sometimes you get those rich cherry notes from an older bourbon. Um, Nick Bernhardt in the house, he says... Love the show. Would you take a Red Breast 27 or a Boss Hog 9? Have had and enjoyed both for me around the same price. Ah, oh, man. Okay, so, man, that's a tough question. Boss Hog 9 is the, um, that's the, the Greek one, right? With the Tentura, with the, with the Tentura uh, liqueur in it. Is that? Is that the one, Nick? Because that one just simply tastes like straight up apple pie to me. I remember it was apple pie filling on top of a cinnamon roll when I tasted that. Is that is that the one? Um, because if eh, man, Redbreast Twenty Seven, I love Redbreast Twenty Seven. But, you know, the, the different batches can vary. Some are better than others. I still think people love batch one the best. But, you know, you're just – I don't think you're really going to find a batch one these days. Um, but if I had to just go off of complexity and what's worth the money as far as flavors goes, I would probably lean towards Redbreast 27. That Boss Hog is really unique and it's delicious, but it's very straightforward. 
it's just apple pie and cinnamon rolls. And that's really it. Don't really get, you get some of the rye spice on there as well. Is it good? Yeah. I don't think it's a $600 whiskey. I'd much rather pay for the Red Rush 27. I think there's more complexity in that whiskey. Um, okay. So yeah, right off the bat, cherry and chocolate for sure. Now, knowing that there's some sherry in here, I'm looking for like, you know, that raisin note, maybe a little bit of nuttiness since it's Oloroso. There may be some of that there, but again, it's Lux Row. So the general consensus is that they source from Heaven Hill. However, being acquired by MGP, you just don't know what's in here. However, again, this is Kentucky. So this is Kentucky straight bourbons. This says no Indiana. I think some people ask, oh, is there Indiana stuff in it now? Not that's been bought by MGP. Um, no, this is Kentucky bourbon. All three of them are Kentucky bourbon. So I would lean that these are Heaven Hills. You know, maybe Barton in there. They have some of the higher age stuff in here, but you know, they're kind of known for utilizing Heaven Hill a lot. So that nuttiness could just be inherently from Heaven Hill. But yeah, cherry chocolate, very light, very fruit forward. Kind of what you would expect. This is this isn't anything that I thought would surprise me. Um, you want cinnamon toast crunch? Get you a Penelope uh, Rio. Yeah, I mean Rio has that um, the what you call the uh, the Ambirana finish, which is cinnamon toast crunch. It's also uh, man, this is getting a little bit. It's getting a little bit floral now, too, a little bit, which is kind of nice. A little fruity, sweet, chocolatey. It's got that Amurana finish, which is, yeah, Cinnamon Toast Crunch or the Taco Bell Cinnamon Twist, which is a popular uh, descriptor for Amurana. All right, let's try this one. Cheers, guys. I know what that three chord bottle is. Drinking it now, pretty good. It's like experienced whiskey, old guy. Okay, cool. Um, hmm. Yeah, now I'm hungry for churros. <laughs> hey, Jeffrey Wax in the house. What's going on, Jeff? Um, that nuttiness that I was getting on the palate, I'm really getting, I'm sorry, on the nose, I'm getting a lot of it on the palate for sure. It drinks light, 98.6 proof. It is fruit forward. It's got some good age to it. Um, I think the older whiskey really is, is prevalent. The sherry influence, I think, however, is slightly muted to me. Now, well, here's the thing. You know, I am a scotch drinker, and I love sherry bombs. Like, I love, you know, scotches, single malt scotches that have a lot of sherry influence. So when I taste a whiskey that has a slight sherry influence, it's almost hard for me to pick it up. And that could be what's happening here. Um, I think it is there in that nuttiness factor. But again, that could be the base whiskey, thinking it could be Heaven Hill. You get the sherry on the very, very end of this on the back of the palate. You get it. But man, it, you know, to me, unfortunately, it's coming off a little bit flat. Um, now, man, now again, 98.6 proof. Generally, the blood oats are made to drink, you know, a little bit easier. Not so proof heavy. I mean, we're sub 100 proof. Um, go for another sip here. I mean, there's cherry chocolate, maybe a hint of raisin there, but it is very faint. I don't get a lot of it. 
this is what I've taken th three or four sips here. It's it's ah man. I don't know if it's a proof issue. I don't know. I think those older whiskeys are overtaking the younger whiskey with the sherry finish on it, to be honest. I think that sherry finish is having a hard time breaking through. What what did we say here? Um, a 16-year-old and a 12-year-old bourbon. Um, but again, maybe that's the point. I mean, you just don't know what a distiller wants to do, especially when they're blending. You know, John Rempe over at Lux Row, he's a masterful blender. Um, so I think he really likes the delicacy of a slight finish on his whiskeys. He really likes the bourbon to shine through. And if that's what he was going for with this, I mean, he nailed it. Because there is not, if you want a lot of sherry influence, this is not the bottle for you. This has a very, very slight sherry finish. It's not strong at all. But if you like older bourbon influences, it's there. The cherry's there. There's a chocolate note there. You get a slight raisin on the very back end, but it drinks very easy. And if you're used to drinking cast strength whiskey and high proof whiskeys, I don't think this is really going to do it for you. Um, I mean, that's my most honest. It's, is it good? It's good. I wouldn't overpay for this. Again, I, I, I'm going to do a full review on this. Finished whiskeys, I think, need more time to open up. Again, this is the neck pour. Usually those could be a little bit tighter, uh, especially in the neck. It needs a little bit of air time. So we'll see how it gets down. Once I get it down past the shoulder, maybe it'll open up and more of that sherry will come out. But right now, I really have I'm having a hard time getting it. Honestly. Jonathan Garrett, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Awesome, man. Now, if you remove the expectations of getting big sherry influence, do you enjoy it? Yeah, I do enjoy it. Um See, already, just opening up a little bit, I'm getting more sherry now. Just that little bit of time. That's all it needed. You know what? Let me add a drop of water here to see. I mean, I know it's already 98.6 proof, but I just want to see if a drop of water will, will just liven it up a bit. Just curious. Um. Wow, it actually brought out the uh, the older bourbon notes, I think, in it. This is a – it's a really nice bourbon. Um, yeah, again, the sherry is starting to come out more a little bit, but I think it's all in the back end. So, yeah, it's, it's good. It's a good high-age bourbon. Another great blend from Lux Row. I would not pay secondary for this. If you see this upcharged, I would not buy it. Um, if you see it for retail, I, you know, I do like it. Um, however, there are so many sherry finished whiskeys on the market right now. If you don't want to pay the money for this, there are a lot of alternatives uh, to, you know, to this for sherry finishes. So, great win last Friday. Thanks for all you do. Appreciate you, Mark Mace. Um, ADHD says, I shot my review for today. The sulfur note really becomes pronounced after being in the glass a few minutes. And you know what, Matt, I could see that. I think that's what's happening. It's just, it's, it's definitely changing, uh, the more as it gets in here. Um, I'm not sure if I'm there where I'm getting sulfur quite yet, but man, it is faint. Because the 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 back the back note is what's confusing me on the back end of this. Like I want it to be like that sweet sherry, that nuttiness, that fruitiness that I'm getting a little bit on the front of the palate, but it's just not happening. So I don't know. I'm a little bit indifferent on this bottle. I'm gonna have to let it open up before I do a full review. But first impressions right now, as of nine fifty seven. On this Wednesday night, Eastern Standard Time, not overly impressed with it. Not overly impressed with it. Um, try to remember the last Blood Oath that I really loved. Um, it, it might be the – God, I'd have to go all the way back to uh, 
to batch four. I mean, the uh, hmm, man. I mean, there's just it's a I mean, it's a solid bourbon, but I don't know. I feel like whenever I see these blood oats, I I want a little bit more of a finish. I feel like it could have used a little bit more of that sherry influence in it for me personally. And I, I think Matt, I don't know if Matt put it in my head, but I could see what you're saying about a little bit of a, sul, a sulfur note on this, for sure. Um, yeah. That one is a, that's a head scratcher. I'm, I'm Guys, literally, I'm like, I don't know if I like it or I don't like it. It's like right in the middle. Every time I go back for a sip, it's like, oh, maybe it's getting better. Then I take another sip. I'm like, eh, I don't know if I like it. This this one's a head scratcher. I'm not really sure about this one. I think uh, I try to stay away from finished bourbons. I really enjoyed Pack Five, which was the oh yeah, that might be the last one I really liked. Terrell, it's a good call out. That cognac one was so good. I'll thank you, Darrell, for reminding me. That cognac one was really good. Yep. Um. Batch two is my fave, says Jonathan Garrett. Seven, says Brian Toner. Uh, I tried four to seven, and four and seven were easily my favorites. The rum and cognac ones were bleh, uh, says Kenneth Rathburn. Um, yeah, four, I agree with you. Um, I was not a fan of the rum one. I did like the cognac one. Uh, is seven the Cal – no, seven wasn't Calvados. That was last year. Which one was seven, Kenneth? Remind me which one was seven. Can't remember. Yeah, Richie Z, yeah. I mean, I, I think most blood oats are kind of head scratchers. Like you love seeing the high age statements on them. You you love that they're blending some high age whiskey in it, but I think I'll still just maintain my statements about blood oath. I think they're really nice whiskeys, really nice bourbons, but they're I don't think I've ever had one that's worth like chasing after. I think if you if you see it, you find it for retail, I think it's a good pickup. Again, you're finding a, an older whiskey. Let me see here. Let me look up the um, Blood Oath Pact 9 XRP. 130 bucks. 130 bucks. Um, there are bottles with a lot younger whiskey going for that much money. So that's all I could say. Uh, I feel like if you like those older flavors, I think for retail, this is this is a decent bottle. But if you want more sherry influence and you you think you're gonna get all this dark fruit, actually let's let's take a look at the um let's, let me take a look at the tasting notes and see what they say. So here we go. So it says on the palate, a melody of ripe fruits, including figs, plums, raisins. With notes of molasses and chocolate. Meh. I definitely got chocolate. I don't know if I'd say cherry. I'm sorry. I don't know if I'd say plums. I think I get more of like a dark cherry in this. It was hard for me to find raisin. I wasn't getting like that cherry raisin note in here. Molasses. Maybe. Um... And then finish as long-lasting fruit notes, complemented by hints of spicy oak. I mean, yeah, you could see it. You could say that about most bourbons, though. You know, even for a ninety-eight, um, you know, ninety-eight point six proof bourbon, it does have a nice little bit of spiciness to it on the back end of it, but it's nice. It's a nice sipper. But you know what? In the realm of like lower proof, high aged whiskeys I've had this year, I think the Mictor's ten year is better than this. Than is better than this. So, um, but again, Mictor's ten is also, you know, was it like fifty or sixty bucks more than this is? <laughs> so, um, mine coated the palate pretty well, but the finish was really light. Yeah, I mean, outside the Star OTS, you have to expect that going in, especially it being only ninety eight proof. Um, I think there's a little hint of spice there on the back end, which I think is some of the some of that Oloroso that really comes out on the back end. But front of the palate, mid palate, you get the age notes. It's a little bit drying too on the palate too. Like I'm finding myself needing to grab water here. Um, 
this is the way. Yeah, Kenneth, I mean, that's the thing. $200 for M10 or 130 for Blood Oath 9. I think Blood Oath 9 is obviously the better value, um, but I think the Mictors 10 just drinks better from front to back overall. Um, you know, this isn't a bad bourbon by any means, but again, I'm going to let this open up, see if some airtime changes it before I do the review later this week, and we'll see what happens. And uh, apparently Matt from ADHD Whiskey Gave a nice little uh, review of it, so let's see what he has to say about it. I'm curious. Um, how does it compare to Pact 8? It's a completely different whiskey. I love the spiciness of, of Pact 8. I got a lot of good spice on that, which made me kind of dig it last year. Now, Calvados, give it or take, with that apple brandy finish on it, you know, that's that's completely subjective if you like that or not. But I loved the finish on the Pact 8 last year. I thought it had a lot of spice to it and it kind of balanced out the fact that it was a little bit of a lower proof. All right. All right, let's go to this next one here. And we're going to get into um, this three chord. And this bottle, they sent me, guys. Again, you know, just being transparent with you, this was sent to me by three chord. Um, I think they had a Zoom call or something to introduce this bottle, which I was was not able to attend. But here's the press release that came with the bottle. So, so let, let's get in. This is an interesting blend here, and we'll we'll get into this. I'm gonna let this blood oath sit out here a little bit, guys. We'll we'll revisit that a little bit later. Um, Wesley Hughes says, "Nice shirt." Yes, it's your it's your name, buddy. I wore this just for you, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man all right dear friend our three chord bourbon team is in infinitely grateful for the support and enthusiasm we have received since our inception okay blah blah blah. Blah, 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 blah blah we have created an exclusive three chord bourbon tastemakers round table that's what this says um it includes preview new blends and collaborations shared with you ahead of retail launches oh so i guess i'm part of this round table that i missed Sorry, three chord. <laughs> Our first series of roundtables presents three chord bourbon honey toasted, which will be available via retailers in May across 20 states. So this is happening right now, guys. This limited release will consist of 1,200 cases and will additionally be available on our website, threechordbourbon.com. Okay. This is a limited edition release from our family of award-winning whiskeys. Blending components. Here we go. Ready for this? MGP six-year bourbon, 21% rye, 28% of the, which is 28% of the blend. MGP five-year bourbon, which is 36% uh, rye and 40% of the blend. And then a Kentucky eight-year corn whiskey, which is 32% of the blend. So that is what's in this blend. Honey Nut Cheerios. That's right. Honey Nut Cheerios. Let's see. Uh, okay. All right. I don't want to look at the tasting notes yet. Let's cover those up. I like getting my tasting notes and then seeing what they say and see if I'm getting the same thing. Okay. Let's see what we get here, guys. Uh, does it actually have a price on here? The proof is 111.3. And I don't see a price. Um. Outside the star, what what was I, – I forgot. Are you um, – Terrence McDermott, are you picking up the Orphan Barrel Scarlet Shade 14-year rye? Yes, Terrence. I do want to try that bottle for sure. Um, is this a – I'm, I'm not sure what the price of this is. So if anybody has any price information on that, let me know. All right, here we go. Um, I thought they were all dickle. Um, you know, some of them were, but this one apparently is not. This new blend is not dickel at all. Cask finished bourbon and corn whiskey finished in honey and toasted barrels. First things first. I get honey and I get banana, which is kind of weird. Honey and banana. I know somebody said honey nut Cheerios, but like I feel like that's all I'm getting now. Not, not so true. About tree fitty? <laughs> it's about tree fitty. It's about tree fitty. Man, 
man, I feel like this is a little bit tight too. <laughs> uh, as I say that, I have to play this one. <gasps> That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I mean, it is sweet. I'm getting a lot of the honey here. I, I'm, I'm kind of finding it hard to get a lot of other stuff, but that is a lot of honey that I'm getting. A little bit of oak. Not much, though. Um, Eight-year Kentucky corn whiskey. You think that's mellow corn? You think they uh, source some mellow corn from Kentucky? I mean... How many Kentucky's distilleries are making corn whiskey? I think it's mellow corn, maybe. Because it's Kentucky mellow corn. Okay. Yeah, I get honey, banana. It's slightly... Um, again, there's a little bit of, a, of like a flower quality to this as well. All right, let's try this one. Here we go, guys. Cheers. Ooh, it's kind of nice. Good spice. Extremely sweet. Um, yeah, this is very sweet on the palate. Wow. Um, let's see here. I'm waiting for Jonathan to come on and click on. I'm seeing 50 to 60 bucks for this Tony bag of donuts. Okay. Yeah, that, that honey, the more you sip it, is coming through. Um, it's extremely sweet. But I will say one thing about this. It's got a nice spice level to balance it out. I think that 36% rye gives it a nice balance here. Um, however, you know, for 50 or 60 bucks, I kind of dig this. If this was a 100-plus bottle, I would say no. But for 50 or 60, this is kind of a nice balanced whiskey. I love the spice of this on the back end. It's still going, guys. It has a nice little spice to it. It's not it's not complex by any means, but it's a it's very sweet, very um I think the honey is coming out more and more here. Beyond the Rose says that's why I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's sweet. Um I'm not so much getting the banana on the palate as I was getting on the nose. On the palate, yeah, it's literally coming off like Honey Nut Cheerios. Maybe like the slightest hint of like a like a bit of honey candy. You know the bit of honey candy with like a like a slight milk chocolate note in it. But the best thing about this whiskey is the finish on it. It's it's awesome. It's lingering. This is a nice honey finished whiskey that you just kind of sip on all night long. That's really kind of nice. Um, I'm going to keep looking for the Green River, says Whiskey Juice. Yeah, that Green River. Oh, the Weeder. He's talking about the Weeder, yes. Um, I have not seen this on the shelf at all. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly what. It says it's available in 20 states. Yeah, honey and toasted barrels. I don't know if I'm getting so much the toasted, but that 36% rye is very much coming through here, especially on the finish here. Um, all right, let's see what they said. So aroma, I said banana. Is there any banana in here? It says oak lactones. Nobody knows what the hell that is. Uh, spice box. Spice box. Is that like the is that like the sixth spice girl spice box? <laughs> what is spice box? Okay, spice box. Uh honey cake. I could totally see honey cake. Cedar, slight floral notes. Okay, I did find it a little bit floral. I think it's a little bit floral. Um, all right, palette. Balanced viscosity that indicates wood, sugar, and honey. Pretty straightforward. 
Not very hot considering the proof. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's not very hot. Taste. Medium plus body with robust toasted character in the mid-palate. Interaction between tannins and sweetness. Open slowly with layer upon layer of charred and toasted oak. That literally tells me nothing. It's a nice honey whiskey. It's for 50 bucks. If this is 50, if this is a $50 bottle and you've never tried anything honey finished, I think it's it's a nice little one to add to your collection cuz the honey just gets stronger and stronger. Uh, it's got a toasted aspect to it. I think there's a little bit of like a marshmallow note coming through on it too. Um it's it's spicy though too, especially the back end of it. It's, it is nicely balanced. Um, Ari, who is the, um, Ari Sussman, who's the master blender at uh, three Chord, actually did a really nice job with this one. You know, whether or not you like the flavors of it, you know, you definitely always look for balance, um, and all that, which is great. Um, so, all right, last thing, Jonathan is here. And before we bring him on, I do want to go through, uh, the double gold winners for, uh, for the San Francisco spirit awards. Uh, this is something I wanted to talk about with you guys. So let's take a look at the list together. I have not seen this. I'm going to react with you guys for the first time if you have never seen this. So this is every double gold winner at the San Francisco Spirit Awards. Let's check it out. I'm going to uh, share my screen here. And we're, we're, about to, we're about to go through this. So And then right after this, we're going to bring Jonathan Mezano on. And learn all about Kayla. I cannot wait to get into these K Luke's um, batch four, small batch, and barrel strength. Um, let's get into here. We go. So there it goes. You guys can see my screen. And let's see. Every whiskey that won a double gold medal at the 2023 San Francisco Spirit Awards. Now they break it down by state. So let's uh look at look at this. Look at that. We got a Basil Hayden ad in the middle. Jesus. All right, Basil Hayden. Okay. Alabama, Clyde Mays Straight Bourbon Whiskey. California, Barber Lee Spirits Bottled and Bond Rye Whiskey. Dole Ball Whiskey. You've never even heard of that. Lost Lantern Single Cask, Corbin Cash, California Straight Rye Whiskey. I'm actually very intrigued by that only because um, Master and Journey is going to have a pick of that coming soon. And I heard that those rise from courts. If you guys have ever heard of Lost Lantern, Corbin Cash is the uh, the owner of that or the name behind Lost Lantern. And apparently these rye whiskeys that they're making are absolutely stellar. Um, all right. Pacific Coast Spirits, Single Malt, out of Colorado, Art of the Spirits, Accent Oak, Boulder Spirits, Breckenridge has, a, has four. Wow. Breckenridge hitting it out of the park there. They have a cognac finish. Uh, Laws Whiskey, so 80 Laws coming back. Rockers, Stranahan's Blue Peak. Blue Peak, really? Blue Peak got a double gold. I don't, I'm not sure if I agree with that. Um, ASW gets a couple. Red X Single Malt Whiskey, totally agree with that. I can see that definitely getting a, uh, a double gold. Distillery Space Hide Single Malt, I don't think I've had that one yet. But guys, ASW, I've been singing their praises for a long time. Absolutely love what they're doing. Illinois, got their few bottle and bond bourbon whiskey in there. Indiana, all right, here we go. Brothers Bond Cast Strength Bourbon. Now, Brothers Bond is that brand that was um, founded by the two actors from the Vampire Diaries. Um, and apparently this Cast Strength one is actually pretty good. I have a sample of it. I've yet to dig into it. So uh, I have to get into that and see exactly what's happening with that. I, I heard it's pretty damn good. Uh, Bushwood, Bushwood, Stillwater Ride, never heard of it. Filmland Spirits, Moonlight Mayhem. I cracked that bottle open a couple weeks ago. I think it's really good. Hard Truth, yes. The Malted Sweet Mash Rye Whiskey, absolutely stellar stuff. Old Hillside, look, Penelope has a private select batch in there. Uh, Proof and Wood, Rare Character, Single Barrel, Yakira Cask Finished. Okay, Redline. Redemption, Short Barrel, and The Clover. Out of Iowa, Cedar Ridge, the quintessential. Well-deserved. The Cedar Ridge quintessential sing American single malt is probably one of the best single malts, American single malts you're ever going to try. And then we have two Templetons. All right, out of Kentucky, here we go. 15 stars, 13-year-old timeless reserve bourbon. Okay, that was pretty good. 2XO, the Phoenix Blend, 
No, would not give that. Uh, as much as I love Dixon Dedman, I think his innkeeper was far beyond the Phoenix blend. Would not have given that a double gold. Angels Envy 2022 cast strength. Finished in port wine. Okay. Augusta Distillery Buckner's 13 year. That's just Barton. That's overpriced Barton. I don't know if I would give it to that. Bardstown Collaborative Series Chateau de Labat 2. I could see them liking that. Barrel Seagrass again. Barrel Dovetail again getting two uh, double golds. Black and whiskey with the Wes Henderson, uh, the Wes Henderson uh, mix-up. Okay, are you fucking serious? Blanton's single barrel gets a double gold. You have to be kidding me. Straight from the barrel, just below it, yes. But regular Blanton's, come on, you're killing me, Smalls. Uh, Blue Note Juke Joint, Blue Note Crossroad. That is some young whiskey to be giving double, double golds. Blue Note Crossroads is not a double gold whiskey. Buzzard's Roost, uh, Char Straight Rye Whiskey. I actually just had that tonight. I could see people loving that one for sure. Colonel E.H. Taylor, Straight Rye. Colonel E.H. Taylor, Small Bats. Really? Double gold? Eagle Rare 10. Uh, okay. Elijah Craig, Evan Williams. Evan Williams Black Label got double gold? All right. someone's Someone's paying for that. I'm just saying that right now. Ezra Brooks, uh, seven-year Kentucky straight bourbon. Four Roses, single barrel. I think that definitely deserves a double goal. That is one of the best values, one of the best bourbons you're going to find. Frank August, uh, okay, Heaven Hill bottled and bond. Really? Heaven Hill second edition corn whiskey. Oh, so that's the 20-year? Uh, all right, I would disagree with that. Hidden Barn makes the double gold. <laughs> Wow. The one finished in Madeira. I can't say I've had either of those. Kentucky Owl, the Wiseman. Luca Mariano, that's sourced uh, Wilderness Trail. Maker's Mark Cast Strength gets double gold. Come on. We're getting Nash Tucky Single Barrel out of, uh, out of uh, Nashville Bourbon Company. McFarland's Reserve. Neely Family Distillery. New Riff. Uh, New Riff Malted. I could see the Malted Rye getting it. Old Forester King Ranch? What? No. No. Pinhook, Puncher's Chance, The Undisputed, Pursuit United, and Pursuit United Rye. That's awesome. Congrats to uh, Kenny and Ryan. Rabbit Holes, Derringer. Oh, no. Do not agree with that. The Rare Character, Exceptional Nine Years Straight Malt Whiskey. I could see that getting a double gold. Those Rare Character, Exceptional Series are exceptional. Rittenhouse straight rye. That's a good rye, but it's not a double gold rye. Russell Reserve 13 year. Okay. Stellum Fibonacci rye. I could see people liking that. Regular Stellum rye. I don't see that getting a double gold. Of course, William Liverwell at 12 year gets double gold. Are you kidding me? Um, Woodford Reserve double oaked gets double gold. Regular Woodford Reserve bourbon gets double, gets double gold. Oh my God. What's happening? Uh, Maryland, Baltimore Spirit, Sagamore Spirit, eight-year-old rye. Yes, completely agree with you. Massachusetts, never heard of them. Michigan, uh, Joseph Magnus, Murray Hill Club. Eh, really, Cigar Blend isn't in that mix, but you have a Murray Hill Club in there. Not really sure. Journeyman's making good stuff. Traverse City making good stuff. I was really happy to see Ben Holiday getting, a, uh, getting a, an award. They are making amazing stuff out of Missouri. Um, New Jersey, Lockstock, New Hampshire, New England Barrel Company, New York, Hill Rock, Kings County making amazing stuff. Uh, Widow Jane, we mentioned her, we mentioned that brand a little bit earlier. North Carolina, Ohio, High Bank, right here, guys, right here in the heart of Ohio. High Bank with that whiskey war, man. Adam Hinson over at High Bank, just blending some amazing stuff uh, over at High Bank. So if you guys have not tried anything from High Bank, that barrel-proof whiskey war is the way you want to go. Absolutely incredible stuff. Noble Oak Watershed. Um, let's see. Tennessee. George Dickel Bourbon getting the double gold. <laughs> Heaven's Door Double Barrel getting it. Jack Daniels. Uh, the American Single Malt. That's the Oloroso Sherry getting double gold. The 12-year-old Tennessee whiskey. Totally agree with that. 10-year-old batch two. Okay. Nelson's Greenbrier. Peg Lake Porker. Eh. Uh, Texas, we have still Austin getting some love. Vermont, Whistlepig, Piggyback, Bourbon getting double gold? No. 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 
Uh, Virginia, Courage and Conviction, American Single Malt. Those are solid single malts, but they're a little bit too low proof for me, to be honest. Washington, you have some Doc Swinsons. Westland, getting some love. Bainbridge as well. Uh, Wisconsin, still in Oak. Nothing from Driftless Glen out of Wisconsin. Really? That's surprising. Wyoming, Wyoming Whiskey, and then Australia, Canada, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, um, yeah, like, wow. So there are some in there that I highly agree with, and there are some in there that I find extremely puzzling. I don't, wow. Um, you know, every year I see that list and it just blows my mind. I, I don't, I don't know what's happening. I, yeah, no, no J. Henry or no Driftless. Now, we don't know if J. Henry or Driftless Glenn actually submitted anything to San Francisco. So we can't, we can't like give San Francisco a bunch of flack because they aren't, in, they aren't, um, uh, because those whiskeys weren't included. We don't know if they actually submitted anything to it. So that's kind of the, you know, you just never know. But, um, so I, I'll say this about awards. And I've said this before. Awards are extremely subjective, obviously, as you see from the list that we see. I think there are some real hitters on that list, and there are some ones that just do not belong in a double gold uh, you know, type of um, award. Um, but what it does do, what awards you know, do you know, for distillers and new brands is put a spotlight on. So even if you don't appreciate San Francisco Spirit Awards, and if you don't appreciate any of the other award lists out there, the people that do pay attention to them and use that to uh, use that as a tool to find a new brand to try, you know, that definitely puts a spotlight on. And uh, with that said, we are going to bring on Jonathan Mezano from K. Luke, who recently just won some double platinums in Fred Minnick's Ascot Awards. So I want to say congrats first and foremost to Jonathan Mezano. Uh, founder of K. Luke, Jonathan. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks, Jason. I'm glad to be here. Appreciate you having me on, man. How are you, bud? Doing good. How about yourself? Doing really good. Uh, congrats, real quick, to the uh, to, to you getting the bill. I am a judge in the uh, in the Ascot Awards. I I'm not sure if I tasted your stuff or not. We all get different samples, but you know, congrats on uh, on on getting those awards, man. That's a that's a huge that's a huge spotlight for your brand. So congrats on that, man. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. It's been an exciting, uh, exciting day for us getting the news yesterday. So, uh, Since you were part of the Ascot Awards, do you think that may have uh, more of a realistic res representation in other awards? Uh, Wesley, it really does come down to what's submitted. Not every brand will submit you know, their, uh, their whiskeys to the awards. Um, from a judge standpoint, not everybody gets every single um, uh, set of samples that are the same. So it's really hard to put that into context. Um, but yes, K Jonathan Mezano, welcome to the Mass and Drum, dude. So before we get into batch fours here of your small batch and your barrel strength, tell us a little bit about the popularity of your single barrel program, man. Your, your single barrel program was so popular. You turned it into a brand. Tell us a little bit about the evolution of that. So kind of my journey, you know, starting off with, uh, with studying wine and spirits to begin with, I started off working in, in fine dining and worked my way up in, uh, in the restaurant world and really got into studying wine. I uh, took my first level of sommelier certification with quartermaster sommeliers, but after work, you know, waiting tables, I always drank whiskey. Uh, started off drinking Jack Daniels, and then uh, one week I tried uh, Woodford Reserve and Knob Creek, and I never went back. You know, and after that, it really kind of opened up the exploration of, wow, there's a, there's a ton of flavors out here and a lot of complexity. And then from there, you know, I started tasting different bourbons. Um, and about 10 years ago, I made my, my first single barrel trek up to Four Roses. And uh, I got a taste of Jim Rutledge, you know. And, and back then, for me, a decade ago, you know, one being a retailer, I've uh, been in the retail side now for 18 years, owning my own store. Um, you know, to buy one skew, you know, at about $10,000 is kind of a big risk, you know, a big investment. And when you look back a decade ago, you know, bourbon wasn't nearly the popularity as it is today. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, the longtime sales guy there, Byron Banks, talked me going up there making that first trip and went with a customer who, uh, who bought in five cases and uh, they told me to do his own custom label for him. And when I did that first single barrel tasting, I was so blown away by the barrel variants from one to another. 
you know, just then you throw in the different yeast strains, right? And the mash bills, all these magical things. And then you really start to understand that bourbon really takes on a life of its own in a barrel when it starts to age, you know, five, six, eight, 10, 12 years. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think distillers, most distillers would tell you the barrel will, will yield 70 to 80% of the flavor that you're going to get out of that whiskey. So. Yeah. So for me, once I did that experience the first time, probably like you, you know, you're hooked, right? Once you, once you experience the magic of what happens in those barrels and those workhouses, um, that was it, man. I picked that first barrel and, uh, you know, fast forward to today, a decade later, um, like I said, being in business 18 years on the retail side, I just picked my 400th barrel a couple weeks ago, 400 single barrel. And, uh, you know, for me, I've kind of seen the single barrel program change a ton from, from most distillers the last couple of years. Obviously, the big name brands got much harder to come by. So to continue my love of bourbon and sharing that experience with customers, um, that's the real passion for where uh, where Caleb came from, you know, where it was born. Um, so my wife and I started working with this company a couple years ago. Caleb is named after our children. So Caitlin, our daughter, uh, who's 10 and a half, and then Lucas, our son, who's five and a half. You know, it's, I was going to, I was going to ask, I was, I was going to ask you where the name came from. I'm like, Hey Luke. Okay. If that makes sense. That's awesome, it's, it's, man. Caitlin yeah. and Lucas. So this is our way to share our love of, of whiskey and, uh, you know, our family with the world. And, um, you know, for me picking out single barrels the past decade, I've always, I've always looked at it. The only thing that really matters is the whiskey in the glass, right? Very seldom do you go to the distillery and taste a barrel that's, that's not good. It's more like you said, it's all subjective. What speaks to you? So for me, everything's always been tasted blind. You know, I'm not worried about the age or the mash bill or any of the other factors, right? Warehouse, where it was at, uh, what the proof is. All I care about are the complexities of what's in the glass. You know, for me, it's, it's all about when you, when you smell the whiskey, you know, as you start to taste it and it opens up in your glass, um, you know, up front, mid palate, back end are all equally important. Um, yep. And that's it, man. That's where the inspiration came from. And, uh, and I, and I think it's interesting. I feel like, like if anyone, and I know Four Roses barrel picks is, is, uh, they could be like a bucket list item for a lot of folks that have never been on a pick because that is probably the best representation of what a barrel pick truly means that I've ever been a part of. Because to your point, you get to try every single recipe um, right there that same day, all 10 of them. So you right. get to try their high rye, low rye, the, the different yeast strains all together. And you see how much you know flavors can change. And not only that, but you're also tasting the different floors in the rickhouse and what a barrel does from – I mean, they don't have high rickhouses, obviously, but just the differences from tier one to tier five – are dramatic you know proof wise and i think it's like a perfect like crash course for like a single barrel selection like if you do a four roses pick then you know how different and how special single barrels can get from barrel to barrel so and i think too if you're fortunate enough to get to uh you know to go through rick houses you know with someone like uh you know eddie russell or, or drew from willet and you really get to go and drill barrels and really get to you know get to be in there and you breathe it in right you feel it and you think about uh like being it being you know picking out non pre barrels, right? I always think about Booker No and all the all the guys that came before me doing the same thing, right? Walking through those warehouses the last hundred years, drilling barrels, keeping out whiskey and tasting it the same way. And it's uh you know, I always hope if you never had an opportunity to experience that, it's a pretty magical experience. And um, you know, so for me I've always been a felt my place was an ambassador for bourbon, you know, tell the stories. I've I've been fortunate to taste pretty much every master of the last decade. Uh I figure I've tasted about 1,500 different barrels, you know, straight from a barrel now. So, you know, for me, it's, it's really sharing that love with customers and trying to explain the difference. Like you said, all those nuances make from tiers and interior, extra barrels. There's a million variables, yeah. right, to what you get in glass. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's exciting. Like, to me, there's nothing like it. Like, getting in a Rick house with some folks, especially first-timers that have never had the experience, that's that's one of the, the best things that I love about doing barrel picks because you get to just see, like, someone's face when they – try whiskey from straight from the barrel for the first time. It's, it's, it really is a cool experience. Um, all right, dude. So K Luke. Um, so I, I reviewed live. What was it? Batch two, batch three. I forgot which one. You reviewed uh, batch two right when batch three was getting dropped. I think it was the day it dropped on the seal box and they review in batch two. So. Yeah. And, uh, I remember reviewing it and then someone told me that, you know, thanks Jason. Now it's sold out. So, uh, cause I, cause I love that barrel strength one. So fast forward to now we're up to batch four. Um, so tell us a little bit, let's start with the small batch here. Cause this is a high rye, low rye blend. 
Um, I'm not sure if you have NDAs, if you could tell us exactly what's in this stuff, but lo- you know, whatever you can tell us what's in this, uh, the, the small bash, let us know. So kind of, let me kind of tell you where to kind of when you look at the labeling and you know, the reason why you see the high ride, low ride, we're sourcing from multiple distilleries, both Kentucky and Indiana. We did okay. have to sign NDA, so I can't disclose the distilleries that Jennifer and I buy barrels from. Um, so originally we were going to list out the ages and the mash bills. You know, the more I sat, as we're working on label design and tasting the bourbons, then I got to thinking, you know, once you put the ages and the percentage of, of rye content, each mash bill, right? I feel like then that's all people focus on. Now, obviously, um, being non age dated, it has to be at least four years old, uh, which everything we use is older than that. So it's to not list the, the age on there, or at least not have the minimum age um, showing above four years old. You know, it's a little bit more risky. It takes some more time to build up the brand. But I really felt that that would make people hopefully crack the bottles open and enjoy and really focus on the whiskey in the glass instead of chasing, well, this batch has so much of this age of this mash bill. Uh, you know, for me, great bourbon is meant to be shared and enjoyed with the family and friends and just, you know, have a good time with it, right? Taste is subjective. And also really comes down to the end phase. Do you love the bourbon in your glass? And that's really what we want to focus on. Uh, so that's why we decided not to disclose exact age and mash bill um, allotments in each whiskey. Damn, John, it just, it's like, that's like my whole mantra, dude. You're like we're a brother from another mother. I love that. <laughs> that's, it, man. that's why I love your show. You know, it's a straightforward <laughs> approach to explain to people what you taste, you know, and that it is subjective, but, you know, here's what I taste and smell. And, um, you know, people either either love you for it or they may not agree, but hopefully they can appreciate the honest opinion and feedback because that's, that's what whiskey's all about. There's nothing better than getting group friends together and grabbing, you know, half a dozen bottles and sitting outside with, uh, with a rack full of Glen Cairns and pouring whiskey and having a good time with it. Yeah, I mean, I I think as as uh, you know, whiskey geeks go, um, I think we look for age statements and we look for details because the pricing of today's whiskey, you know, is all over the place. Uh, generally, on the higher standpoint, so I think we look for those details, you know, to help us make educated um, uh, educated decisions. But again, to your point, if you taste the whiskey and you start getting a trusted brand that you know, no matter what they're going to put out, you're going to like then I could see that side of it too. So. Yeah, man, that's really my goal, you know, to get the, get the whiskey as many glasses in front of people I possibly can, whether it be someone like yourself, you know, in a large platform or a group of guys, a small tasting, you know, or in-store tasting or tasting for 20 people. Uh, you know, for me, it's all about getting the whiskey in the glass and getting people's honest feedback. And, uh, you know, I drink a wide range of different styles of bourbon. It really depends what you're in the mood for. To me, that's the most fun part about it, just like wine. All right, so let's get into this small batch here. This is... Um... Uh, this is 100 proof. This is batch number four, uh, mash bill of high and low rye. Minimum age of four, you would say on here? Yeah, so, it, you know, it would have to be at least four being on age dated, uh, but it's older than that. There's nothing that's even four years old in these ones, so it's all Okay. Me. All right, good to know. All right, man, so... So, so actually, real quick, so you have different batches of, the, of your small batches, are you going for consistency or are you looking for a different profile that's unique to each small batch? Because I think that's a question that I get a lot, especially with usually you hear the term small batch and you're thinking they're going to try to do something consistent. What's your goal with the small batches with the K Luke line? So that's a great question. You know, so for us right now, everything is four barrel batches. Um, so I tell people, not only does every barrel have to be really good, but every barrel has to offer its own layers of complexity, right? Each barrel has to have its own its own personality and notes it offers to the blend. Uh, and we, you talked about a little bit on your last show, you know, I can tell you blending, blending bourbon is far more difficult than picking out single barrels, right? When you're picking out a single barrel, you're looking for kind of a more yeah. you know, multi-layer, but still kind of singular stream of what you're focusing on. So I take notes on every barrel that we own and I taste them quarterly as the season change, the whiskey changes, I need to taste them fresh. Um, and, you know, over the years, I've gotten to do some blending at other distilleries. And what, what you find is, so my base for every blend starts off with my notes and trying to put together the blend, which sometimes translates to exactly what I envision. Sometimes it's not even close, right? Sometimes one girl overtakes another. Uh, so for us, it's a series of blind tastings uh, that we go through, really trying to line these whiskeys up for what offers the most complexity and what really hits on all the high notes for both myself and Jennifer. Uh, obviously, having male and female palate, we hit on different things. So we know it's something special. We're both in agreement that, hey, this sample right here is, is the one, or these couple of ones we're really excited about. Uh, so, no, we're not really trying to make the batches the same. It's really more about what batch speaks to us flavor-wise. Like, what has 
the most complexity. What hits on the nose, you know, up front, it's got a good mid palate. And then the finish is really important to me, uh, especially in 100 proof bourbon. You know, a lot of 90 to 100 proof bourbons I really enjoy, but then 10, 15 seconds later, they drop off in nothing, you know, and it's like, ah, where'd the flavor go? Dude, um, I, I am with you. I think finish for me, besides texture, is probably the most important thing that I look for in a single barrel pick. And my bourbon group will tell you, all of our all of our picks always will have a long, a medium to long finish for sure. Yeah, and that's part of why we do everything blind. Also, like I said, it's I create the batches, you know. But then from there, it's not one to say, well, this batch has no more this age or this match bill. It's like, okay, well, when we get these all side by side, what's the most exciting in the glass, you know? And once we're done comparing our batches against each other, um, then we put them up against what we feel are the best bourbons in the market, or talking to other consumers, or you know, people like yourself. When you say, hey, I'm really excited about this bourbon. I'll go out and find a bottle and uh, we'll run that blind or a blind tasting. I usually try to do it the first time I taste it because uh, that's the goal, right? And it's, again, it's subjective, you know, but I want our bourbons to be linear with people's favorite bourbons out there. If not their favorite, at least you say, hey, when I taste all these blind, wow, this is my favorite bourbon of all time. You know, this one's right there with it. So that's that's really the goal. So, the small, the, 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 yeah, the small batch for me immediately, the first note I picked up was clove. I got a nice, I got a nice hint of like a, a savory baking spice note, but it's also coupled with some really nice sweet flavors. There's a little bit of like a, you know, powdered sugar note, like a sweet cookie. Yes. So I get that same note, but for me, I kind of get like a, almost like a sugar cookie with like citrus peel in there. You know, sometimes on the holidays, you'll get like the kind of like candy orange mixed in some of those cookies or like Italian desserts. Like that's kind of, yeah, for sure. Just enough of that spice. The goal is always have enough spice to kind of heighten the, the bright, brightness and sweet tones. I, I mean, I love that. I love getting clove in a whiskey. I think that's one of the most underrated, like, uh, baking spices. I mean, normally you'll find cinnamon, but, man, you get clove, you know, it's something that's a little bit – going to a little bit of a darker place. Yeah, I said a little bit kind of savory in there. Um You know, people always ask me, what, what's your preference between the 100 proof and the barrel strength? I'm like, well, you know, we blend them both, so it's not really a fair question. But for me, it's more about, like, the drinking occasion. Like, if I'm going to sit and drink bourbon, like, if I'm cooking on my on my big green egg, if you follow me on social media, I love to cook on my, my grill. If I'm hanging out with friends, if I'm going to sit and spend the evening enjoying bourbon, for me, 100 proof is, like, the perfect go-to. Uh, for me, like, one of my personal favorites was always the Four Roses 100 proof single barrels I got to pick. Yeah, but to me that was a nice balance of sweet, spicy tones. You know, hundred proof. You could drink it all night, not get yourself in too much trouble. Uh, that's really the goal behind this hundred proof is to drink barrel strength on a softer, softer level. Yeah, dude, I'd um, I'd agree with you. This has a really nice balance of flavors. Again, I talk about balance all the time. Sweet up front, good texture, nice balance, good spice in the finish. This starts off very sweet. It's got this sneaky, like, butter toffee note in the mid palate that I wasn't getting on the nose. That's actually like making me want to dive back into this. And on the finish, you get more of those, like we called out, kind of the black pepper, the spicy, the clove. Uh, some of those baking spices all come out on the back end, which is really nice. It, I mean, for a hundred proofer, if you actually almost just got like a little bit of banana note here on the nose, too. Um, if you told me this was higher than 100 proof, I might believe you just based on the spice, which I like. And that's really the goal. You know, like you said, kind of get those citrus tones up front. And then for me in this particular batch, uh, mid palate, I get like this really nice caramel cream. Yeah. And then like you said, as you're kind of like getting that caramel cream coating across your palate, then all of a sudden the spice tones start kicking in and it kind of brings back some of the citrus. Uh, and then it kind of heightens that that sweet tone in the mid palate. Uh, and for me, it really extends the finish. And that's that's really the goal of this. Maybe, maybe like the slightest hint of like a chocolate too, a little bit here. This, this is a really nice balanced blend. Um, this is good, man. It, you're definitely showing your skills as a blender. I think people that get into blending, like you mentioned, don't know how difficult it is, except for Matt from ADHD Whiskey, who's the you know he's the greatest blender on YouTube. So I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, it's good thing, you know. Yeah. Um, but for me, you know, that's that's part of the fun of it too, right? It's it's that challenge of trying to find that perfect marrying of flavor and really get those complexities. And there's some nights you know, I'll sit here and I'll keep blending and blending, you know, and blending, and I'm like, man, I just can't quite get the pieces. Then you know it's time to walk away, right? And then I'll just go sit and have a pour something, relax. Uh, and then when I come back to it, start tasting through them, you know, I'm like, okay, 
I like this blend, but it's missing the brightness or it's missing the, you know, mid palate tunes or it's missing the spice. And then from there, because we're able to buy from so many different distilleries and we have different mash bills and entry proofs and ages, I'm not locked into like any one style, right? So I can go back to my, uh, basically my pantry of, of barrels and say, okay, well, I need to find something more in this, you know, this lane, right? Brighter or, or richer or spicier. And then I say, okay, I want to take these three barrels, maybe re-blend this, rotating at one barrel at a time with these. And then we go back to the drawing board and blind tasting around. So. Um, so what's your process like? Are you, I know somebody had asked in the chat, which I think was a really good question. As far as your blending process, I know you, you kind of talked about it a little bit, but are you, are you utilizing different proportions from your barrels and letting them sit for a couple of days before you taste them? What is that? What is that process like for you? I'm always, I'm always fascinated by um, the kind of the steps that blenders take in creating their whiskeys. You know, so for me, it's like I said, I'll kind of look at my notes and say, okay, this is kind of the end result I'm looking for. What barrels are going to get me there, right? And that's kind of the start. And a lot of times, you know, I'll take a, like a pipette, you know, maybe I'll blend a small portion, um, you know, just trying to taste it as I'm going. I'll retaste some of the barrels as I'm going. And then from there, I'll kind of start running the blends. And then when I'm excited, you know, we'll blend up you know, several ounces of it, I'll put it aside, right? And I'll, I'll keep going through that process. And really the goal for me is to get to, you know, eight to 12 blends I'm really excited about. And then from there, let them sit a couple days. And then my wife and I will sit down, we taste everything blind. So mm -hmm. she'll never taste any of the blends. Uh, and other than me working on them, you know, it'd be my first time to really sit down and focus on them. And we will sit and taste through all of them. We don't discuss them. So it'll take us, you know, I'd say 45 minutes, an hour to taste through them. And then we sit and compare notes, right? We'll talk about each batch and what we liked or disliked or what was missing. And then from there, you know, I go back to the blending board and we just keep going through that process until we narrow it down to, you know, I would say three to five we're really excited about. Um, okay. And then we start folding in the other bourbons, right? The other best bourbons in the market to run against ours blind. And uh, that's that's the process, man. We just keep going through that process. Oh, I, I like that. Excited. So you so you put it up against some other, uh, you know, hard sought after bourbons to see how it stacks up. We do. So when I, when I meet people, I always ask what they're what they're most excited about, right? What's the new bourbon that's exciting? Now, granted, it's got to be in kind of competitive set, you know, stylistically, uh, price point if I can, but it's got to be stylistically is the most important thing. And then I try to blend them in, you know, in the blending process of blind tasting, hundred proof. Or real close to it and 100 proof and then barrel strength but as close as i can get to making it um as difficult as possible to find the best bourbon to plant that's the goal every time we do it so yeah i'm yeah that that's interesting i like i like the fact that you compare it to some i mean obviously like you said you have to keep it at a comparable um you know kind of in a comparable uh, bubble of you know different whiskeys that you could you know age and proof and whatever you want to go to but um all right so this is the one I really want to get into, which is the batch four high ride, low ride blend, but it's barrel proof. So we are here. This is the silver label of K Luke. Um, and I, I think this is already sold out, dude, on um on uh yeah, it's it's sold out on uh on seal box, which is awesome. They had some earlier before we started. Yeah, 117.7 proof. That's crazy, man. Man, I'm super excited for you to try this one. All right. I I loved batch two, so let's see how batch four is. Now, this is a completely different blend than the small batch, correct? Yes, and I, I failed to mention that, you know, sending out – I try to send out some information without being too much. Um, and it's one of those things I forgot to mention, and I and I told customers I would make sure – so I'm glad you brought that up. Of course, I'd already forgot because I get excited tasting the whiskeys. Uh, so each blend is blended separately for what it's going to be, 100 proof for barrel strength. Uh, I take a different approach stylistically and flavor-wise I'm looking for in the blends. So, yes, there are two totally different blends uh, blended specifically to be 100 proof and barrel strength. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, wow. You know, I know I know, maybe because we were talking about Four Roses earlier, but this comes off like a Four Roses, almost like an LE, like a Four Roses LE. It's got – this beautiful balance of citrus, dark fruit, and vanilla extract off the nose immediately. Wow. I mean, the nose is pretty fantastic. There's there's a lot going on here. Um, I'm going to compare it to the Lux Rail real quick. <laughs> yeah, the Lux Rail is getting a little better. <laughs> Yeah, so you, you, know, you mentioned Four Roses. So I've done more single-barrel selections from Four Roses than any other distillery. 
And uh, so is, is that kind of your blueprint, you would think, a little bit? Well, you know, if you kind of look at what I'm doing, right, a blend, high rye, low rye, different distilleries, different mash bills. Um, for me, Four Rose is Limited is one of the most consistent releases out there every year um, because it's very well balanced and diverse and a lot of flavor going on. Um, you know, Brent's an incredible person. I spent a lot of time with him, you know, always, always happy to, uh, to share his love of whiskey and knowledge with the world. Jim was the same way when he was there, uh, you know, Mandy, the whole team there. So yeah, I'm definitely a big fan of what they do stylistically. So you can see a lot of that kind of inspiration, in my blend of having, having all those different assets in my fingertips when it comes to blending. Wow. This gets into a whole nother level of like brown sugar, orange zest, like rich caramel. Um, man, right like like three quarters of the way back on the palate, you get like this um, this dark fruit punch that just like comes in. It's I don't know if it's a, it, it's, a, it's like a cherry grapey like raisiny. Yeah, there's there's some there's a lot of richness to this too on the on the back end. And you know if I remember correctly from batch two. I enjoyed that one a lot, but I think I might like this one better. So match, batch two is a little bit of a meteor bourbon. You know, it's got more spice tunes, really kind of more grippy. For me, so batch three was uh, was softer, was more fruit driven. For me, batch four, when you pretty much hit on it right there, um, I didn't want to say anything to you. I had a chance to kind of taste it and give your notes. But for me, I get black forest cake. Like this dark oh, chocolate. Yes. And like black forest cake. Cherry. That's a really good call out. Yeah, that yeah, I'm but I feel like I'm getting something it's I mean if it's cherry, it's like a black cherry, it's dark cherry. Um, which kind of plays into I guess to that to that um to that black forest cake note that you mentioned. Yeah, for me, like if you reduce down like starter syrup and then added spice tunes to it and put it over chocolate, like that's what I get in this one. So this comes off a lot sweeter than the small batch. This has an elevated sweetness to it that just Takes it to another dude. This so reminds me of Four Roses limited editions. This is crazy. <laughs> it is man. Cause look, look, Four Roses Limited LEs, you could kind of, you know, people like you know more than others, or you know, certain years, you know, more than other years. But I'm saying in the context of you know the ride it gives you. So the texture of it, the sweetness, the spice. The dark fruit, the length of the finish here. This, this is really well constructed, dude. I'm yes, not I really appreciate listen, it. Listen, if I if I didn't like it, I'd be like, eh, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, I love your reviews. I love your honest opinion and feedback of everything you taste, you know. And for me, you you've got to stand behind your whiskey, right? And if if I blend every whiskey, if it's the last bourbon I get to go home and drink, right? That's how important every blend is to me. That is one of the most crushable 117 proof bourbons you're gonna have. That's delicious. Yeah, you can see we've. Uh, so I'm, you know, that I'm four, glad. I mean, it hasn't I'm, been released very long here, so. It's, uh, I'm glad I uh, got a bottle of that because that's that's ridiculously good, dude. Wow. I mean, the small batch is good, but this is this is where it's at right here. This is stellar stuff. Damn. And you know, so for me, at, at the end of the day, when I work a long day, right, and I finally get a chance to sit down and relax, I'm, I'm going to get to have one glass of bourbon, right? Like, this is what I'm looking for, something that's got a lot going on. It's going to evolve in the glass as I'm sitting there relaxing. And, uh, you know, usually for me, being realistic, by the time I get to the end of the day to really sit and relax, I'm going to sit and have one pour, and I want it to be one really good, really solid, lingering pour. And uh, that's the goal of the girls right here. Dude, and I'm just, like, letting it kind of develop on the back of the palate here. And there is so much going on. Um, again, you, you concentrate on finish and I think that's why I like this so much. There, there's a, there's a brown sugar. It just blooms on the very back end of this, that it just stays sweet and spicy. It, it kind of just coats the palate. Dude, this is, wow. I'm impressed, man. Thanks, sir. I, I liked batch two. I thought this was going to be a little bit more of the same down that, down that highway. But you you set a bar here. It's got to be at least this good and further on like every time now, man. You realize that, right? <laughs> That's right, man. I'm, <laughs> I'm up for the challenge. You know, for me, it's all about having a good time with it, getting great whiskeys in the glass. You know, again, every batch is going to be a little bit different. Each batch is going to show its personality and, uh, you know, kind of what we got to experience. So, um, 
Yeah, man, for me, that's the most exciting part. And it's something that my wife and I get to do together, you know, and uh, really have a good time with it and put a lot of work into the blends. And it, I mean, it pretty much takes us like every bit of the two months in between the uh, batches. So kind of moving forward, you know, we bottle everything at Bardstown Bourbon Company. Our goal is going to be, we're going to release five times a year. So basically every 10 weeks. Um, okay. And you'll see a couple other limited things coming out. You know, like I said, my background is in the wine world before I got into whiskey. So I had a lot of connections in that, in that realm. Um, you know, we've done a couple of straight Kentucky 15-year uh, single barrels released early on. We did a, a batch of toasted barrel rye. So we've got some toasted barrel rye, toasted barrel bourbon laid down right now. We're getting ready to taste again. Um, then we'll get batch five out for Father's Day. So it's uh, it's been real exciting. You know, we've expanded distribution now from Mississippi, our home state, over to Louisiana and up to Tennessee. Uh, and then Sealbox, Blake's been awesome. You know, really helping us get whiskey to different parts of the country that we would never have an opportunity to get to. Um yeah, man, it's been really exciting. So three markets and online through seal boxes. Uh, it's been really exciting considering batch one only released in uh, July of last year. So Yeah, so th this is what I'll say to everybody watching right now um, and anybody who watches on the replay. First and foremost, uh, thanks again to Jonathan Mezano for coming on tonight. Also, you guys, if anybody's watching, if you have not hit the like button yet, please do uh, before we get out of here in a little bit. But what I will say, so as far as like an overall review, guys, if – so what's the price of this, Jonathan, real quick, off the top of your so, head? So, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I meant to mention that before. So the 100 proof is about $89 retail, and okay. the barrel strength is about $115. Um, you know, so, again, we knew they were going to have to be on the higher price point side to, to be able to get older bourbon. We weren't willing to sacrifice to go, you know, sub four years. Yeah. The, the barrel strength for the 115 markup, totally worth it. So I'll say this. This is better than most – of the stuff that I've had this year, on honestly, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not just saying that. Um, I think the balance is there. This comes off like a limited edition bourbon that is extremely well blended. There's a front, there's a middle, there's a back end palate, there's a lingering spice to it. This is what you look for in a bourbon. I don't think I've had, I've maybe had a couple bourbons this year that have given me this experience. I'm. Listen, I'm not just saying this because you're on. Uh, this is a really, really well-constructed blend. So if any of you guys watching got a K. Luke <laughs> Barrel Strength 4, I mean, you're – I mean, this – I could see why this one double platinum. Um, it's really good, man. I'm very impressed with this. I, I don't get impressed very often, especially – I've been very uh, – I mean, this year, what have been my top whiskeys I've had this year? Sagamore 8-year, rye, delicious. Jack Daniels 12-year, amazing. Um, other than that, I've had a lot of kind of in-betweeners. Um, solid but not amazing bourbons. This, I think, kind of has everything you want. It gives you an LE experience without paying an LE price. 115 some people might see that as high-priced, but I'm telling you the different notes and the, and the flavors you get I think are worth it. So thanks, man. And it's, you know, for me, like, uh, you know, making Fred's top 25 list last year was, was really huge. And like I told people, you know, at first when they're reading the list, I'm like, well, you know, for us, it's really exciting, right? K Luke makes top 25. It's one of the most successful bourbons. And I got to think about it. I was like, well, not really. You could only get in Mississippi at the time. Right. So yeah. now it's Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee, and, and online through Silbox. Uh, if I get Blake in that inventory to keep it, uh, keep it in stock for longer, a couple so, days. So, so since it's sold out on Sealbox now, it, are there any batch fours left for anyone? Man, so in, in my store, we sold out in a couple hours. Um, I know there's still some over in Louisiana. Uh, man, Correct. Louisiana, maybe North Mississippi. Those are probably gonna be the last places to find it. I've been watching Sealbox like ticking down, and I was like, oh, right before the show, there's a little bit left. There's a little bit of a chance for people to get it, and uh, he still has some hundred proof available. Um, you know, and, and like I said, they've been a great partner for us to really be able to get the whiskey out to more people. Um, you know, so if, for anyone, me, so if anyone wants a bottle, just just Instagram, pop them, don't watch them. And they'll get one. <laughs> Sorry, Troy. Troy. Troy's the man over in Louisiana for sure. I know. Troy, Troy is the Pied Piper mm -hmm. whiskey down there, man. Oh, Jim, man. Really so if people want to join on, follow us on social media, uh, sign up for our newsletter. We'll be, as we get into more states, we'll be releasing those, you know. But to be honest, um, damn. This is really a project of passion and really the excitement in every batch. So we don't plan to grow to too many states too fast. Um, obviously, everyone's asking me, you know, how do we plan to get more whiskey on the market? We'll start looking at batch six, maybe move up to eight barrels. Uh, but like I've told everyone, we've got to taste eight barrels and see, are we happy with that eight barrel blend? 
Do we get the same results? Um, you know, if not, maybe I had a conversation with Bart time about increasing our, you know, our bottling to uh, more than five times a year. Uh, but that's really what we want to be. We want to have the time to properly lay out the blends, you know, and we're not on a exact timetable. Uh, Bardstown has been a great partner, really understanding that, like, look, if we don't feel they're ready, if we give enough lead time, we need to push back. Uh, they've been a wonderful partner for us so so far, especially being a small company. So, Bob, or Popham's getting requests already. I need the barrel strength. Uh, I, I don't think Troy's going to share any of his. Indiana, Indiana is waiting impatiently. Uh, saw some at some stores today in Louisiana. Old Carter. Oh, yeah, Old Carter Batch 14. I would put up there with one of my favorites this year for sure. Um, tell us about Batch 5. What's – is it similar to this? Is it a little different? What do you got going on for Father's Day, man? Yeah, so we are uh, we are in the final tasting right now of, of Batch 5. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we're running – we always run the Caleb Batches and the, and the Blinds as well. Um, yeah. As you can see, Batch 4 is some stiff competition to beat. Right now, Batch 5, the favorites are leaning more toward like that – that caramel cream kind of toffee notes. Um, but I'm still kind of playing around with tweaking a few barrels here and there, trying to get it just right. Like I said, for us, it's uh, it's really important. You know, every blend that we put out is exceptional, not just uh, not just good or great, but exceptional. So that is uh, that is the work behind being the blender. This is really good stuff, man. I I applaud you. I applaud the work you put into it. I know blending is not easy. You seem to have somewhat figured it out. I know you're only as good as the barrels you get. But sometimes you can make it a little bit better with your blending prowess. Uh, Jonathan, dude, this is amazing, man. Thank you so much for not only sending the samples or coming on and telling a little people a little bit more about your brand. I, I appreciate it, man, for sure. No, man, thank you. I appreciate it. you got a great platform and, uh, you know, great following. And like I said, I really appreciate your straightforward, honest reviews of Bourbon. And, uh, you know, I send customers to your site all the time because I want people to get, you know, get – so much true opinion of how bourbon tastes, right? Not is it good or is it bad, but what do you taste? And again, it's subjective, but uh, yeah, having some honest opinion is a great jumping off point for people to uh, to get a feel for the bourbon before they get a chance to try it. So yeah, we got Ron Miles here in the house from uh, Bartstown Bourbon Company, who's just an amazing person. Uh, love Ron, um, man. I, I miss you, man. Hope we, I hope I get to see you soon. Uh, hope uh, hope the little girl's doing well too. Um, yeah, I mean. Glad to see you, you know, a partner of uh, Barstown Bourbon Company doing really well. Yeah, I mean, they're doing – this is this is fantastic stuff, man. So um, so last thing here, Jonathan, let – if um, if anyone is in Mississippi, where 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 can they find you? Oh, man, it, uh, I'm pretty sure we've exhausted all the stories on the, on the Gulf Coast that had it. Um, it's only been out a couple weeks, you know, but once, once we sold out the store, which is pretty quick – um, well, I'm not, I'm not even talking about the bottles. I'm just saying if they want to come to one of your stores, where where oh, so, so my store is my Zonos Fine Wine Spirits, which is Nation Springs. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, for me, K Luke is much more than uh, much more about partnership with, with a lot of great retailers all over the country. You know, guys like Troc up at Elixir, you know, Nashville and uh, Riverbend over in Louisiana, and all the other great stores are supporting us from all over. You know, great stores uh, all over Mississippi as well. So, man, it's uh. Again, you can find it in my store, but we have no problem. We send people to wherever they can find the bourbon because K Luke is all about uh, is getting great bourbon with us, man. So I appreciate people coming to my store, which is uh, again my son is fine wine spirits in Asian Springs. But uh, I want people to uh, to pick up K Luke because they're excited about K Luke, man. So I appreciate all right, man. You. Well, uh, yeah, I, I really want to thank you for coming on, hanging out with us, uh, telling us about your brand, guys. Do not sleep on K Luke. I'm telling you right now especially these barrel strength blends when that i know i know the the four is kind of gone right now but when that father's day one drops the batch five just be all over it i promise you you will not be disappointed jonathan thanks so much for coming on the show everybody watching uh really appreciate the support tonight we had a friggin' packed show a lot of news a lot of labels a lot of stuff we went through some new tastings um, you will see my review, a full review of the Blood Oath come out pretty soon. Uh, with a uh, once it gets a little bit of airtime, I really do think it needs a little bit of airtime, and we'll see how it is. Uh, like, subscribe, make sure you do that before you take off. We'll see you right here next week with a special blending episode with Hello Whiskey and Friends. Speaking of blending, we're gonna blend some uh, some shelf uh, some shelfer easy to find bottles and see exactly if we could turn four solid bottles into something stellar it'll be an, an interesting crossover episode between hello whiskey and friends and here on the mass and drum uh jonathan thanks so much uh hang out do not go anywhere and as i always say it's not about the whiskey it's the people you share with cheers love you guys 
and I will see you next week right here on the Master and Drum. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank you, Jason. Cheers, Jonathan. Appreciate it, man.